Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Chan. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Polaris. We are a national anti-trafficking organization working to end sex and labor trafficking and restore freedom to survivors. We are also the creators and the operators of the US National Human Trafficking Hotline. It's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 day a year crisis line for trafficking victims to be able to get connected to help. And over 15 years, we have been able to address more than 80,000 situations of sex and labor trafficking and directly connect 30,000 victims and survivors to the help that they need. And the reason why we do that is because in the long run, in order for us to be able to truly end human trafficking, we have to be able to respond to what victims and survivors need, but we also have to work to prevent it. And it's really with that perspective of prevention that I am so thrilled to be introducing today's panel. Because human trafficking ultimately exists because it is high profit and low risk. And for the first 20 years of the anti-trafficking movement, we've been tackling the risk. We've been tackling the fact that human trafficking can be addressed through criminal justice. And while that is essential and important, now is the time for us to also make sure that we're tackling the profit. And there is no better lever to pull than the US's might when it comes to trade. And so I am super excited to be introducing today's panel, Ambassador Catherine Tai, who is the US trade representative, who has been a tremendous leader in making sure that the trade conversation is expanded, that the table is not only business leaders, but is now also workers and its civil society organizations as well. To be in conversation with my good friend, Sophie Otiende, the brand new chief executive officer of the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery. Ambassador Tai. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, I'm Sophie Otiende, and I'm so proud and happy to be having this conversation with you. So I'll probably just kick it off. Yeah. So uh, the theme of this year's forum is strategic competition. And I think in the past, the Biden administration, and you've said that you welcome competition that support American workers, grow the economy, and creates jobs at home. I think for someone like me, who's not necessarily American, the question is, in your role, do you think that trade policy uh, can be used as a force for good, not only here, but also in general, globally, to be able to address uh, justice and support for workers all around the world. Um, so Sophia, I'm so delighted to be here with you today, with all of you. Um, Catherine, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, before I launch into my answer to your very thoughtful question, let me also thank the McCain Institute um, for everything that uh, you are doing to combat uh, forced labor uh, and modern slavery. Um, the work that you do in the advocacy space, um, the partnerships with civil society, and the work that you do on the ground and in the field, uh, they are making a difference. and. Uh, um, I think it is important for uh, all of us to be uh, using the tools that we have. I just want to thank you for your vision and your leadership. Sophie, to your question um, about um, how um, um, working on um, combating forced labor, uh, helping workers in other countries, or, or and you know helps workers here at home. Um, you know, I think that um, one of the things I find really quite inspiring is the. Um, the global labor movement's um, fundamental principle around solidarity. Uh, and it's, it's not just about the solidarity in the movement, that obviously is very, very important, but it's also a matter of economics. So um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, in the context of our trade agreements, um, US practice uh, in trade policy, it's been bipartisan, uh, and it's been going on for a couple decades, uh, is uh, to incorporate um, worker protections and environmental protections into our trade because uh, these are matters that impact the terms of our economic competition. Um, let me just say uh, one word about why it's so important to have this conversation right now. It, obviously, I think, you know, forced labor, uh, slavery, it is about the issue of human dignity 
and that is always relevant. But if I put it in the context and through the lens of what the global economy is going through right now, I'll just highlight um, uh, two or three sets of disruptions that we're going through. Um, <clears throat> I always go back to 2016. Um, and um, seeing some indications, um, some strong indications of a backlash against where uh, this version of globalization, let's call it globalization 1.0, has taken us. Uh, there was the Brexit referendum, and also there was the election of President Donald Trump on a very, very strong perspective around uh, trade uh, and uh, needing to put America first in the sense that America wasn't being placed first. Um, we've just we've been going through over two years now of a global pandemic, global public health crisis that has brought with it um, a, a economic um, disruption and turmoil, supply chains, um, uh, uh, supply and demand mismatches, um, and uh, then also um, just in the last uh, two months, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I think that there is, in general, a sense that um, this global economy that we have been used to operating like a, um, a, just a well-oiled clock has been thrown out of whack, that some of the parts are missing and some of the gears uh, have gotten rusty and somehow the whole thing, this, um, this confidence that we used to have in the global economy has, um, uh, has become... Um, uh, we feel insecure about it. It's at this time that I think that uh, the opportunity is presented our, to all of us in the world to reshape the terms of the global economy, how we compete with each other, how we, uh, how we create incentives for um, um, interacting with each other economically, to fashion a, a globalization 2.0, if you will, that can correct for some of the shortcomings of globalization 1.0. And I think uh, one of those is to drive incentives to design interactions where we are pushing standards up and we are, um, 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 we are combating exploitation wherever we find it. So I think that in this context, I'm uh, particularly um, uh, enthusiastic and feel like there's an opportunity that we have to seize uh, in um, um, using the levers of our trade relationships and access to US markets and capital uh, to condition them on um, the elimination and the condemnation of the use of forced labor in global supply chains. Thank you so much. And I'm, I like that you use the term solidarity as something that is important in terms of driving this con conversation and in terms of where we need to go as far as uh, the next step or, or what you're saying, globalization 2.0 is concerned. And you're constantly you know, bringing attention to forced labor when you're having this conversation. So my question is, why is this really important to you? For someone like me, this is important to me because of my experience and where and some of the things that have happened why is it personally important to you because i know that most of us are motivated by different things so for you why is this a huge motivation to address forced labor well um you know for those of us who find our our way into jobs in public policy and government there are a lot of different motivations for someone like me and i think for a lot of uh, us in, uh, in government, um, I think that ultimately there is a motivation to work towards a better world. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, in particular, I've, I've been a trade policy professional for 20 years. I started off as a, as a trade lawyer, uh, worked at USTR as a, a trade litigator, uh, went to Capitol Hill um, to work as a trade policy staffer, and I've come back as the U.S. trade representative. I do trade. I think the question is, you know, um, uh, what do trade and forced labor have to do with each other? And I'll just tell you, over the course of the 20 years that I've worked in this area, um, one significant um, weakness that I've seen grow over time is this sense of disconnection between trade and um, U.S. Um, international economic, economic policy and the sense that it is relevant or the sense that it is positive um, to individual people's lives and the impacts that all of these decisions and policies can have on human beings. And so in this moment, again, of transformation, I think that we have a tremendous opportunity to 
uh, be able to fashion uh, what we need for a better world. And what lies at the core of that is to make relevant these large macro conversations about trade flows and um, access to markets and um, um, uh, investment incentives and bring them back to how do they impact human beings and how do we harness these incredible tools of growth and development to benefit people like you and me and all of you. And if we can't make that case, uh, I don't, you know, I don't think there is a globalization 2.0. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that um, uh, that is um, uh, what motivates me to come to work every day and to engage with uh, trading partners, civil society, and really importantly, the business sector uh, to try to uh, reorient the way that we think about uh, what the purpose of trade is. I'm glad you said you spoke about it being you wanting this to be human centered, because I think one of the things, especially as an activist, is trying to convince, consistently remind people that everything is connected, right? That all the things, whether you're in business or whether you're in politics, that is connected and the connection is that human element and wanting to protect human dignity, which sometimes we forget when we talk about competition, when we're talking about supply chains, we forget that it's about people. Right. And I think uh, there are so many people that this conversation, especially people in business, sometimes forget the, that connection. So the question is, it's easy to discuss this as a moral reason. And I'm sure many people in the room expect people like me to argue why this is morally sensible and why we should be doing it. But from a business perspective, is this the smartest thing to do? And if it's the smartest thing to do, what are some of those, why is it smart rather than moral? So leaving the moral discussion aside, why is it smart for us to actually eradicate forced labor, child labor in supply chains and actually discuss that along with our trade policy? Um, I, I love this question because the morality of this issue is actually extremely clear. Uh, but what is the business case, right? And in Globalization 1.0, I think the business case is um, you harness all your public policy tools to drive efficiency into lower costs. And, and in that system, that's a system that's going to incentivize exploitation, exploitation of people, the planet, uh, et cetera. So you're, you're looking for maximum efficiency, right? Um, I think uh, a lot of the disruptions I talked about are reorienting a lot of us to thinking about uh, incentivizing resilience, strength, um, and uh, incentivizing sustainability. So much feels very fragile in our world right now. So um, how, do we, how do we build this out um, to uh, be more durable? Um, and um, I, think, uh, I think that's the... The, the critical piece here um, in, um, in, in talking to different arguments, uh, to, to different uh, audiences, um, you have to have different arguments and a different vocabulary. And so part of what you're asking me is, um, how do you make this case to, to the private sector and to business? Um, I, you know, um, let me give you this example. Um, uh, if you are, uh, enabling and incentivizing uh, the use of forced labor. It, it drives this kind of vicious cycle um, where uh, you will be undercutting costs um, and you will uh, push yourself to the point where that competition is no longer sustainable. Um, there is an economic competitive element here, which is if you are operating in the United States, and um, uh, not to say that we're perfect, um, but uh, uh, forced labor uh, is not a model that anymore our economy is based on. Um, and you are competing with producers in other jurisdictions where forced labor is allowed or is tolerated, um, you will always be at that competitive disadvantage. Um, uh, you are enabling the erosion of your own strength and competitiveness. Um, I want to just tell you a very short story because I spent the beginning of this week in Scotland and in London 
uh, for um, uh, trade conversations with uh, my British counterparts. And I met the, um, the mayor of uh, Greater Manchester, uh, even though we were in Scotland and London, we were not in Manchester, but uh, he came to participate. And I started the conversation with him and I said, you know, um, I've never been to Manchester, but what I know about it, watching a lot of BBC period dramas is, <laughs> and I watch a lot of them, but uh, Manchester was this textile producing powerhouse in the 1800s. And it was so interesting because, you know, um, he said, well, that's exactly the story I wanted to tell you which is that Manchester used to be called Cottonopolis in the 1800s. And I said, I bet we sold a lot of that cotton to you. And he said, yes, in fact, um, that um, uh, the American South supplied significant um, uh, portions of that cotton to be made into uh, fabric in, um, in Manchester. And it was during the American Civil War that the workers, the mill workers in Manchester took a vote and decided that they would no longer be willing to work on cotton produced by slaves in America. And that boycott um, had a significant impact on um, what happened uh, in our history here. Um, and uh, um, the, 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 the real point to his question, uh, or to his story though, was that Abraham Lincoln had sent uh, um, a, a statue of himself uh, to Manchester. And uh, they are, um, they're revamping the statue and they wanna, have a, they wanna have a ceremony. And you know, um, he was promoting this idea that one of us would come over. Uh, but this is the part that really moved me that he said that um, you know, attached to the statue that Abraham Lincoln sent is a plaque that says, to the people of Manchester for your Christian heroism. And you know, I think that um, uh, that is for me a really um, beautiful story and uh, historically relevant to um, our own history as a trading nation um, that um, I think remains relevant today, which is um, through our trade and economic policies, we can bring about improvements in um, the way our, our world works. Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting story that I wasn't aware of. I think in, in response to that, and again, going back to what are some of the ways, because I think, especially for those of us who are in civil society, it's so easy for us to silo ourselves and not have those conversations that you're saying. You know, conversations find language, a different language with different actors. So what do you think are some of the things that civil, what are some of those hard conversations that civil society, government, and business need to have to incentivize, as you're saying, a supply chain that does not have forced labor? Because many people, when, when we try to talk to people about the fact that it's possible to actually operate a supply chain without forced labor, the whole what people think is minimized profit. Mm -hmm. So what, what role what are some of the conversations do you think we need to start having mm -hmm. to push that, as you've said, that conversation of resiliency, yes. that there's greater resiliency if we do not have forced labor in supply chain? Okay, I'll give you um, two examples. So one is at the World Trade Organization. Um, uh, there has been an ongoing 20 year negotiation over uh, trying to discipline subsidies to fisheries. And this is meant to be a sustainable development goal to save the fish so that there will be more fish for us to eat and more fish to be fished by the fishermen uh, whose livelihoods um, uh, uh, depend on uh, our fish stocks. And um, um, uh, one of the first things that um, uh, we did uh, as we came in as the Biden administration, when um, the question was presented to me, uh, what is the position we're going to take in this 20 year long fishery subsidies negotiation? Sort of looked through all of the pieces of that negotiation and I said, you know, based on my 20 years of working in this area, I know that especially in distant water fishing vessels, forced labor and trafficking is a very significant problem. If you are so vulnerable as a worker on one of these ships being way out at sea, separated from your family because you are looking for a way to make money to send it back to them, your, uh, your documents are taken from you, and um, you have very little leverage 
um, to advocate for yourself in those situations. And there's so many vulnerable to forced labor and trafficking. And I looked through this 20 year long um, history and record of this negotiation and I asked, has forced labor ever been raised as a topic, uh, as something to be disciplined? And the answer was no. And I said, well, we have to make the argument because if you think it through, we are disciplining subsidies to fisheries that create unfair competitive dynamics. What is a bigger subsidy than not having to pay your workers? What is a more unfair subsidy uh, than, uh, than having free labor? Um, so um, that's one aspect of what we're doing, which is uh, that is an uncomfortable conversation yeah. at the WTO with 164 member economies of different levels of development and some of whom are huge facilitators of it. I think the second element I wanted to share with you, which is, um, you know, can we make the case to businesses that uh, they can still make a profit? Um, and, uh, and turn a blind eye to forced labor. And I think that this is one of those conversations where um, uh, I had a, a really interesting discussion with one of our captains of industry and one of our masters of capitalism at the beginning of this year. And um, uh, we were talking about um, sort of the public policy environment and um, opportunity for reform for strategic competition um, uh, for the United States and the global economy. And the thing he said to me was, um, what you and the government need to do is you need to make the rules and you need to tell us what we can and cannot do in certain areas. Because if you just rely on us, we will not be able to do it. We are not incentivized, whether it's because of uh, the um, obligations to shareholders or you know, uh, uh, through our capitalistic structure, we will not be able to do it alone. And so whether it's for national security or if it's for um, strategic and competitive reasons, it is the government's role to lay down these rules and uh, to, to Catherine's comments earlier about you know, looking at the risk and creating criminal liability for um, being involved in forced labor and global supply chains, I think from the trade perspective, what we wanna do is be able to take all of these systems that create incentives for firm behavior and um, uh, to create risk here, um, investment risk, um, uh, you know, um, business risk. And you, if you look at the US law, uh, we have a very absolute import ban on goods that are produced in whole or in part using forced labor. Um, if you don't know what's in your supply chain or how the elements of your goods are produced, you are incurring a significant risk that those goods do not come into our country. And that is a risk that I think business should be incentivized to respond to. Thank you so much. And I think it's part of your leadership and in saying that, um, in saying things, the things that you are saying that give some of us hope that finally there's a chance that this conversation is going to get into rooms that we've been hoping that it gets to. And one of the things that you did last year we, at, at, as G7 Trade Minister was deliver a historic statement on forced labor. And I think that basically declared that there's no place for forced labor you know, in the global trading system. And I think it was a, quite a strong statement. We welcomed it, we celebrated it. And the question is, what does this mean for workers practically? And what are you hoping that other G7 nations will do and their partners? Like practically, what are some of the things? Because making the statement is something that we welcome. Most of the time, people are always asking what next after that statement, okay. yeah. Uh, let me answer that question and then I'll have a, a, um, an interesting anecdote for you at the end too. Um, so uh, we as the United States have um, this so Section 307 um, uh, law um, that uh, you know, uh, says there is no place uh, in the US economy for goods that are produced through uh, forced labor. Um, but the enforcement of that, how you implement it, it is quite challenging. Because how do you prove and how do you know, yes. especially given how complex global supply chains can be? 
Um, so that is something that we are grappling with and um, something that uh, Congress has acted on quite recently with respect to um, the evidence of the use of forced labor in China in the Xinjiang area with the Uyghur Turkic minority, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, relates to the, uh, the evidentiary burden that we know enough there that uh, our Customs and Border Protection will say, we presume that this was uh, made using forced labor unless you can show us otherwise. So uh, that is something that we are doing. Uh, something else we are doing. In the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, we have the strongest three-party prohibition that tracks uh, our law that says that not only we as the United States, but Canada and Mexico also must ban um, the import of um, uh, products um, that were created through forced labor. And um, you know, the challenge there also is to ensure that uh, Mexico fully implements it, uh, but then also to share with the Mexicans and the Canadians, because we share these long land borders with each other, um, how to implement this very strong policy to ensure that it means something. Um, there are a couple other uh, interesting aspects, which is um, for Europe, and I think also for Japan, but let me focus on Europe in particular, because I know why they're not looking at an import ban like we have. Um, Europe, as you know, is 27 sovereign countries that have kind of come together as a customs union. Um, the European Commission uh, doesn't control all the borders. They, control, they, they can unify the policy, but they don't actually control it. And so I think an import ban through the EU is something quite challenging for them. So um, what the European Parliament has done is they are fashioning what they're calling due diligence laws that place a responsibility on the traders to know their supply chain and to know um, the factors of production that have gone into uh, what they are trading um, and using that as a way to um, uh, address and eliminate uh, forced labor in the global supply chains. So, um, you know, I think that when we are working with our partners, we're not demanding that everybody take on the same tools that we are, but that we look at the objectives and the, it was a big deal that the G7 came together, all, all seven of us plus the, plus the EU, um, uh, to say um, as a matter of values that, um, you know, we are unified. It, it was very strong. Uh, and we will continue to work with them to um, mainstream this conversation with all of our partners. But the anecdote that I wanted to share with you was at the end of April, I had invited my British counterpart to Baltimore for a set of trade talks and explorations. I mean, we, we did a, a labor roundtable, then we switched to a business roundtable, and then the last roundtable we did, we brought labor and business together, and um, all three of us talked to each other. Uh, in the course of that conversation, we talked about um, uh, forced labor and uh, our strong stance against it. Um, our, our, our business stakeholders agreed. And um, uh, what was interesting is there is a, uh, a brother from the local uh, electrical workers union. He's not a trade policy professional. So this was one of the first kind of really super trade wonky conversations that he had participated in. And uh, he, he put up his name tag and he said, you know, I've been listening to all of you talk about um, the fact that we all agree that um, there's no place for forced labor in global supply chains. And he said, I guess I'm kind of new to this conversation, but um, you all are talking about this like it's a really big deal, which it is. And he said, shouldn't that be a no brainer? The fact that you all think that this is such a big deal really worries me. Mm -hmm. And I, I so appreciate having him at that table because it gave me the context of, yes, this is a no brainer. And yet, you know, we are strategizing how we as a G7 can mainstream uh, this conversation and to proliferate the resolve of other countries and economies to take a stand. Uh, the fact that this isn't a no-brainer from a policy and legal perspective, um, I think is really humbling. Thank you so much. And again, really nice to hear that it is a no-brainer, but again, as you're saying, when it comes to implementing it practically, that's when we face most of the challenges. My final question before we finish wrap up is during the President's Intelligence Task Force, uh, to monitor and combat trafficking, you announced that uh, you will lead a whole of government effort to develop like trade focus strategy. Now we come back to practical. You are what what you 
you committed to do. So what would be the purpose of this strategy and what are some of the things? And again, what are some of the ways that people in this room can rally behind you because we now know it is a no brainer to be able to support that strategy? I think that's a, a great question and uh, thank you for paying attention to all of the forums and the opportunities that we have to weigh in on this issue. I'm extremely proud of um, the US Trade Representative's Office and, and not just um, uh, the team that I've assembled and the career team there, but uh, over um, multiple administrations, and this is bipartisan, that um, you know, uh, at USTR uh, in these administrations, but also uh, because of the uh, leadership in the US Congress on a bipartisan basis, we as a government have been using trade to enforce our values on forced labor since the 1930s. This import ban law that I talk about is, is from the 1930s. Um, we've tightened it in um, 2015, again, strong bipartisan support. And so um, uh, our, um, our, our strategy at USTR is to organize ourselves, all of the things and all of the areas that we have been working to advance um, this focus on eliminating forced labor using our trade tools. Um, uh, that's what we're doing. And we have a, a lot of pieces of the puzzle uh, that we are organizing. And I think that the purpose is to, to share this with other agencies um, that um, uh, may not have been as focused in their policy areas on this. And then to take that conversation to other countries and yes, you know, to our stakeholder sectors and including our business sector. Thank you so, so much for this wonderful conversation. Of course, I'm, I'm very impressed with the work that you've done, and I'm sure my colleagues in the sector are really, really impressed and support the work that you've done, and we really look, look forward to partnering with you in ensuring that this happens and some of the work that you're doing goes on. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. Thank you so much to the McCain Institute for building this platform and allowing us to have this discussion. And I hope that we can continue interacting with all of you in ensuring that forced labor and child labor is something that we do not have to deal with. Thank you.